All right, we'll get started. Welcome to the lunch symposium hosted by Dot Decimal. Um, I just want to give a couple notes. Uh, Dot Decimal has the booth 211. Uh, it will be open starting tonight right next door. I am not an employee of Dot Decimal, so I won't be over there. But since I'm up here, I thought I'd give a shout out. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is James Kavanaugh. I'm a medical physicist at Washington University in St. Louis, which is affiliated with Barnes Jewish Hospital and the Segment Cancer Center. Uh, I have been working with their product for about three and a half years now, and I did my thesis on it. So they've invited me to t come talk today, and I really appreciate it. So thank you to all Dot Decimal for this opportunity. Today I will be presenting on clinical use of bolus electron conformal therapy, or BECT, in the treatment of shallow and irregularly shaped tumors. And in your, just as a quick shout out, um, in your manual it says I have a doctorate, like an MD. I do not. I'm a master's degree, so if you have any clinical questions, I won't be able to answer those. Um, but any physics related ones, hopefully I can take care of that. So just a quick background, we'll start off with some background information on the bolus ECT process, kind of how the design operators work, the treatment planning side, a lot of the terminology we need to get into. Uh, moving from there, I'll talk about the clinical workflow that was set up at WashU. Uh, starting from the time of consult, moving through simulations, treatment planning and ordering, and first fraction, uh, therapy, dosimetry, physics are all uniquely involved throughout this process, and I'll kind of highlight the roles that each person kind of takes on. And then I'll round it out with some special cases uh, that we've seen in the last year and a half, uh, specifically um, treating the nose, uh, a patient we treated for the back, and also a foot case. So some background information on our institution. Uh, we have 10 linear accelerators between our downtown main institution and three satellites. Um, as of the beginning of this year, we had six radiation oncologists who have used that decimal. That's now increased to eight. Uh, we have also have three physicists and two dosimetrists who have worked extensively with this dot decimal. Besides myself, the physicists are Omar Wooten, Lindsay Olson, um, Marilee Spengler, and Anthony Meglary are the two dosimetrists, um, but I'd also like to make note that Tammy Center is another dosimetrist who's done a number of plans, and we have a couple more being trained right now. So since 2010, that's when we treated our first patient. Since then, we've treated uh, 35 plus at the beginning of the year. We've done another eight since then, so we're up around 44, 45. And this ranges from a number of sites, including head, face, neck, uh, feet, lower leg, back, some shoulders, and uh, a number of breast and chest walls. Cases. So let's just start off with just standard electrons. Why do we even use electrons? Well, electrons are optimal for treating superficial tumors with depths of less than or equal to about six centimeters. And this comes from a number of their characteristics, uh, namely that they have this broad, effective region that provides a uniform dose, and that provides us with the ability to treat the tumor with pretty uniform dose, 90% to about 100% on a flat surface. Uh, in addition to that, we have both the sharp distal fall off, going from R90, the depth of the 90% isos line, to R10. And you can see that in this image above, as well as finite penetration or your practical range, so that anything distal, so say you have an OAR down here, is going to receive a lot less dose just because electrons aren't going to be able to reach that depth. Um, within modern clinical electron therapy, most Linux have a number of discrete electron energies, and I'm sure all of you are aware of this. Um, but they range from um, 6 MV to 20 plus MV, depending on your linear accelerator. Uh, typically, we prescribe uh, our RX to the 90% isodose surface. Uh, and then the energy is selected based on that decision. Uh, so as a general rule of thumb, and again, you mostly are probably aware, but you take whatever depth the deepest part of the target is, multiply that by 3.3, and that should provide the lowest energy. Uh, but since it's a discrete energy, we often have to round up. So it's just a quick example, so we have it kind of as a frame of reference at the front of our minds throughout the presentation. If say we have a target that has a deepest depth of 4.5 centimeters, and we provide it with our standard varying uh, electron energy, 6, 9, 12, 16, and 20, what energy should we use? We do our quick math, we end up with 14.85, so we have to round up to get to our 16 MeV. And again, like I said, our objective is to cover the target with a 90% isodose surface. But since we're using these discrete energies, and for a very simple case where we have a flat surface and a very uniform thickness target, we may have to round up for the discrete energies and we're treating a little bit of healthy tissue distal to the target. And so an easy solution, as most clinics do, is to add a flat uniform thickness bolus, and that pulls that 90% isodose line back up so it's hugging that distal target, giving us a little bit more sparing. 
And then you can do this with a number of uh, options, superflab, aquaplast, some red wax, possibly some wet gauze. Uh, but that's not often what we see. We often see targets that have different depths. We have a deep portion and a shallow portion. We see the fact that a lot of patients have uh, surface irregularities, say we're treating a nose, and that provides a lot of complication for election planning process. Um, in the case of surface irregularities, we end up with some hot spots that are lateral to wherever it's sticking out, or if there's a valley, you're going to have these hot spots in that valley on the order of 120, 130 percent, depending on how steep that surface changes. Uh, in addition, you may have, uh, like I said, some variable depth targets, so that even though we're treating to the deepest depth of the target when we're getting that coverage, on the shallow side, we're treating a, a significant portion of healthy tissue just distal to that shallow portion of the target. And in addition to that, you may have some sloping surfaces, like a chest wall, where you have to account for the fact that this, as the surface is sloping, you have different angles, and historically you may have treated that with matched electron beams that provides um, good conformality, but you end up with these massive hot spots throughout your target. And you can see in terms of both the surface irregularities and sloping surface, if you can decrease that slope, you can get better coverage and you can also reduce your hot spot. So these are a number of challenges. And so similar to case one, where we talked about the uniform thickness, if we have a variable thickness bolus, like case two, we are again prescribing our 90% to cover the deepest portion, but we're treating all this healthy tissue down here. So similar to case one, where we use the uniform thickness or constant thickness bolus, the variable thickness bolus can be used to bring that 90% isodose slope to hug that distal part of the PTB. And you can see that as an example here. And this is where bolus electron conformal therapy comes into play. And just as a kind of a definition, bolus ECT is the use of a single electron beam with variable thickness bolus that is designed to shape the distal 90% dose surface to conform and contain, contain the PTB. Uh, this is an example, uh, it's actually a prehistoric example where they're treating parotids. You can see how you have the brain stem here, oral cavity here. If we weren't using this, we would end up getting a lot of dose to both of those OARs. But in this case, in the 90% line, it's fine as this dark pink line, we end up getting really good coverage. Uh, as kind of the presentation title suggested, dot decimal provides this in a clinical setting. Uh, it was a, they've established their commercial BECT product. Um, it's based off of a design process that was developed by Lowe et al. out of MD Anderson right around 1992, and it utilizes blue machinable wax that's milled to create custom bolus. And this machinable wax, you can see that on the bottom right, the top right is where, in a picture of their actual design uh, clinic where they're milling these bolus. The bottom right is the same bolus, you can see the distal side of it, and that's what's up against the patient, resting on the patient, design on the CT. And so we take the CT and can shape it exactly to the patient surface. And then on the proximal side, when they mill it, this inner portion here is where the beam's going to go. So you have a flat top, that's for structure, and then the beam's going to go inside this milled portion, and then that milled surface is designed to shape the 90% isosceles line so we get the coverage we want. Now, a quick example of a comparison with and without. Here you have, um, we're treating target on the skull. Uh, we utilize 9 MeV electrons treating to 80 or 800 centigrade. You can see the deepest aspect in this case is right about here. Uh, you have the 90% isos line right here. You had to go with that energy just because the other one wouldn't cover. And you end up with a lot of dose going through the skull into the brain. Uh, it, when you have the dot decimal bolus on top of it, it pulls that 90% and a lot of the other isos lines up. So we're treating just the target, preserving a lot of the brain tissue. So just some of the terminology that I want to keep in um, front of our minds as we go through this. Um, the modulated region is that center region that I just showed you. So this here, this whole area, that's the modulated region. So when I'm referring to that, that's what we'll be talking about. Um, and that's where the bolus thickness is milled to shape isodose to the target. There's another region called the inner bolus margin. And if you look at this projection, you have the yellow line, or sorry, the red line is projecting to the outer edge of the PTV on both sides. And the yellow line is projecting to five millimeters in towards the center of the target. So this inner bolus margin is a user-specified distance from the target edge towards the central axis. Um, it's a flat extension of the modulated surface, and it minimizes the effect of the rapid reduction of target thickness. So it's typically about five millimeters. So what does that mean? Well, as you can see in this five millimeters right at the edge of the PTB, there's a rapid change of the bolus thick, or sorry, the target thickness 
So it goes from about two centimeters rapidly up towards the surface. If we modulated the bolus surface in that same region, you'd see something similar where it would go rapidly up towards and it would make a very sloped structure. And the downside of that is you have a sloped uh, structure, you're going to get hot spots. So what they do is they stop modulating the bolus surface five millimeters from the edge of the PPD and just extend it out laterally. And that allows the contour to not have that sharp surface. And you end up getting a pretty uniform dose throughout. Another term, piece of terminology, the outer bolus margin, it's also known as the outer block margin. Um, it's a user-specified extension of the milled surface from the block edge out towards the edge of the milled region. And it allows for a couple of things. Um, number one is looking at the minor modifications of the block after the verification simulation. So, for instance, and you can see that here, here's the block edge in green, and there's the edge of the milled surface right there, and that's on the, this, this example is about seven millimeters. We typically have a default of a centimeter. Um, and a couple reasons we do this is because even though this is the edge of the beam, because electrons scatter in the head, they scatter in air, you get a number of electrons that are outside this beam. And if they do not have this extension, and let's say this portion that shoots up for the structure is located right at the edge of the beam, then you're gonna get a lot of in scatter back towards our target, which we don't want to have. And so by extending it out, it gives you a little bit of a margin to work with. Also, let's say that we do our first simulation, and we'll talk about the full process in a little bit, um, but it allows you to do some minor variations of where maybe you want to extend the, bowl, or sorry, the jaw out, the aperture out a little wider. You can do that later on because you have some area to work with. And finally, the unmilled region is this structure I've been talking about on the edges here. It's a flat outer border, and it provides structure and aids in the daily setup. So just a really brief background of uh, some of the design operators is fine by low at all. Uh, we've actually talked about the two extension operators. Those are the two um, inner and outer margins. Uh, in terms of creation operator, how it's going about finding how thick it needs to make the bolus is based on this, let's see if it comes up here, there it is, idea that the bolus thickness, B, should be equal to R90 depth minus whatever the depth of your target is. So if you look here, if this is your depth of your target, and you know that your R90 should be exactly this depth, and knows then to calculate B, to add that much of bolus along a ray line coming from the source through that projection of the target. So that's kind of the background, getting into some of our clinical workflow. This is the, the nerdy, uh, important, but nerdy part of the process that physics usually do behind the scene. Um, the ECT commissioning process, First off, you have to install the software. It's really quick and easy. It takes about an hour. It's free on their website. Um, Window-based PCs, internet access is needed because it communicates with their servers at their institution. Um, you don't need any additional hardware. It's not needing its own treatment planning system. It's just some standalone like uh, PC that you might have your record and verify on, like Mosaic. Um, like I said, it's approximately an hour, and they have demos to go along with this. One thing to keep in mind, though, at our institution, we had really easy access to install this. I could go around in two hours and install it on 10 computers. I've talked to some other institutions that have some uh, bureaucracy that they have to go through to install new software that can take a week or two. So do this well in advance of whenever you want to use it, as opposed to waiting towards that first patient being sent. Otherwise, you get in a little bit of trouble. So we've installed it. We now have to commission the software. Uh, it takes standard parameters. So things like source to aperture distance, nominal electron energies that you have, 6, 9, 10, 12, 16, 20, um, whatever the R90 depths are associated with those energies. And all of this is input in the background. And I apologize for this. You can't really see these numbers. But these are your standard numbers that you may have just within your clinic. And all of this should match what you have in your treatment planning system. Now, in addition, once you've put all of that in there, we also have to make sure that our treatment planning dose calculation algorithm can handle the bolus itself, because it's a little bit different density, it's a little bit different material, so it may be slightly different, so we want to actually have commissioning measurements, and there's two specific measurements we're taking. Uh, first, you do the verification PDDs, um, and dot decimal will provide two different phantoms, bolus phantoms for this. The first one is a block phantom. I don't have any images, I apologize, but it's a block phantom. Uh, that has an uh, inner P, if it's flat on the surface, they'll give it to you. And you can do a profile down the center of it, and that will be your PDD. So what you do is you take this, you scan this phantom in, you bring in your treatment planning system, you calculate this as standard uh, electron field, and then you take it out to your machine, put a film in that a vertical film in the phantom, and you can take a measurement and compare it to what you have in your treatment planning system. Similarly, for verifying the profiles, they provide a 
a phantom that has a flat distal surface that can sit right on top of some solid water. It has a modulated proximal proximal surface uh, that will, I think it produces a head and neck, mimics a head and neck um, plan. And you can put some film within your solid water. You take a scan of this planet, bring out your machine, you can scan it, uh, take your films over and compare your film measurements to what you have in your treatment planning system. So our general workflow starts off, at, like all of them do, with patient consults. Um, and you typically, the physicians will come and find the physicists at this time. And that's important because uh, we have to think about setup. Setup's a little bit different and it's really important. And so they'll bring us in, we'll take a look at what they're talking about and can then discuss with our sim therapists of how we're going to approach setup for individual patients. It also provides education for the patients because they'll be, this is one of the rare circumstances, they say, see physics at multiple steps along the path. So we just get introduced to describe the process. Starting with day one, that's our initial CT simulation. We set the patient up in what we are going to have for the same setup for the whole treatment. Uh, and we do the same immobilization, masks, or elf cradles. Uh, from there, we take those images, we bring them into our treatment planning system, we do fusions, contour creation by the MD, our dosimetrists select the beam and the angles and energies we need to use. And then from that, we can create this virtual bolus software. It actually creates a structure which we're going to override, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the bolus fabrication, once we have the bolus that's been made, it's been approved by the physician, uh, they like the dose distribution, we send that off to dot decimal, they fabricate it, they do some quality assurance on their end, and then send it back to us. That's typically day five to day seven. And then on day eight, we've scheduled a verification sim, so about a week between the initial sim and the verification sim. And we do this for a couple of reasons. It gives us uh, a setup so we can actually set the patient up with the bolus in place and have a full data set which we can do our dose calculation on. And in addition, we can actually do our quality assurance on the bolus. So uh, as we've scanned it through, maybe there's a rare, and I've never seen this, but there could be a case where there might be an air pocket in our bolus that would cause issues. We now get to see the full bolus, not only the outside of it, but the inside. And then treatment, the first fraction is typically on day 10. And between the verification sim and the first treatment fraction, we have pulled in our new data set, fuse it with our initial data set, and from there, we can bring over our structures, our beams, our physician will then look at them, approve them, and we send it across. So what cases are really good for dot decimal? Well, it has to be electrons, so we want our depth less than or equal to six centimeters. Um, typically, you'll see something that has a variable target depth, and you can see that in the image on the right, which is a little bit deeper uh, in the center, a little shallower on the edge. Um, in this case, uniform bolus is really not going to be sufficient. Uh, we may have critical structures, just distal. So in this case, you see some lung, but we may have oral cavity or, um, like I showed before, brain stem that we want to spare dose to. Um, and then because we're using bolus, uh, patient skin uh, surfaces, the dose is going to go up to the skin, so we have to be under taking that into consideration. And then finally, if you have a regularly shaped surface, like I mentioned before, um, that could, that decimal could help in reducing the hot and cold spots produced from that. So patient setup, both physician and physics are present. The physician's going to delineate the volume, typically by wires, their standard electron process. Um, and this is where we have to have thought of a little bit ahead of time. So we want to orient the patient so that the bolus is going to be either having using an AP beam or plus or minus 20 degrees. And we want to be as close to AP as possible. That's just for stability purposes. If you had a steep angle, that bolus can slide right off, may not line up really well on a day-to-day -day basis. So for cases such as if we're treating um, anything on the face, they're pretty much going to be standard scan with the, in a mask. If we're treating chest wall and the scar wraps all the way around laterally, then we may send them not fully decupitous, but at an angle so that way we can get a pretty good angle from the AP or 10 degrees off. And that's where we're considering the anatomy. In addition, we want to try to minimize any collision risk. So maybe we're sending something, treating something up by the shoulder, and we have a shoulder to worry about at the top of the head. Um, so we want to try to minimize that as possible. So maybe arm stretchers in cases like that. And all this varies on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. So standard immobilization devices, masks for head and neck, we use alpha cradle for our thorax or any of uh, our limbs. Um, we typically will cut out our mask one centimeter beyond where the doctor has wired their contour. And that's just because we want our bolus to sit flush on the skin. We don't want to have the mask in between where the bolus is and where we're treating because that's going to provide a little more air, a little more uncertainty. If we're using eye shields in the case of patients for head and neck treatments, we'll have to cut out a rope above the eyes. All of this is done at the time of the initial sim. Alpha cradles, it's really important that all of these pieces, if we're using multiple pieces, 
are registered together. So for this gentleman here, you could see that he had um, a pillow at the, for his head so he could be a little more comfortable. Uh, we actually put the base of that inside the alpha cradle and then form the alpha cradle around that. Because if you think about if this pillow is off by a centimeter in the soup imp direction, that changes the angle of the shoulders, changes his back, and then the dot decimal is not going to fit quite as well. So you want this as consistent as possible. Some special considerations at the time of initial sim. Uh, typically, we scan with three millimeter slice thickness, but for really small targets, we'll go down to 1.5. Um, scan length, and this is really important. So you want to extend the scan at least five centimeters, both superior and inferior of where your target ends. The reason for this is the dot decimal bolus has to be designed inside the data set. So if you cut your scan right there to the PTV and it wants to extend that bolus out further, it has no data set to extend into. This is important if you're treating the top of the skull, in which case a lot of people will just stop their scan right after they clean the patient. We need that data set, so you have to scan at least five to seven. Um, if you rotate your collimator, so say you're treating a scar for a chest wall, you have to rotate your collimator to fit all of that in, then your corners of where it's going to soup in are going to extend almost 10 to 12 centimeters beyond your PTV. So in cases like that, you want to extend it even further. Uh, if you're using eye shields, you need to discuss that with your physician. Um, if you are treating anywhere where there's air cavities, like the ear or the nose, you may tape it shut or you may fill it so that you have some more consistency so there's less air in there. And finally, you have to really be very consistent with both marking your patient for setup, and this is pretty standard. But we take extensive images because we are trying to reproduce setup out of verification sim or treatment planning. Since it's different than what most people are used to, we just have it documented really well. So moving into the initial treatment planning days, days two to five, um, the MD is gonna come in and they're going to, well, we'll step back a second. We're actually making our external contours first. There's some modifications we do to this, and I'm not sure if you can see this, but there's a yellow external contour that goes around here. It looks a little bit different because it's actually including the mask, and that's just because if we don't include the mask, then the bolus surface is going to think that it should be flush against the skin. But in, over in these cases, laterally, where the target's not going to be, we want to make sure that it's going to be on the mask, because that's how it's going to be treated. Over the portion where there's actually the target, there's no mask, so the external is going to be right on the skin. And then in cases where you may have eye shields, you're using eye shields, you need to carve out we usually extend our uh, bolus, or sorry, external surface out so that we can include this width and the size of the eye shield. Um, additional things we may choose, and you can see how the external's way out here. That's because the patient needs to breathe. So we need to account for the fact that they need some way to breathe. In this case, we're treating uh, the upper lip as well as the right nostril. Um, and then we also minimize uh, any really sharp edges because if there are sharp edges, the bolus may be created that's really pointy and then that weight is really uncomfortable for the patient. So we smooth out our external bit a little bit there. We just do typical wire contours, both inside and outside, and do density overrides for that. Um, and then one thing to keep in mind, we actually learned this a little bit the hard way. Um, for our PTV contour, especially for really large targets, the doctor's going maybe over 90 slices where they're contouring on transverse slices. I'm thinking maybe something like a sarcoma on the, the back case I showed earlier. And their thickness may vary from slice to slice. And so you might have three centimeters, three centimeters, two and a half, two and a half, two and a half, three. You don't see that if you're just scrolling through in this direction. But if you look on the sagittal direction, it actually creates kind of one of those valleys and you get localized hot spots. So it's important to look at the transverse as well as the sagittal. If you see something like that, you can make a PTV ops and that just kind of fills in that little bit. In terms of beam selection, I mentioned this before, angle should be AP plus or minus 20 degrees. But one thing to keep in mind is we're not picking the angle necessarily based off of the patient's surface. We're actually looking at, we want it to be perpendicular to the distal PTV surface. Um, in case, many cases, they're really the same thing. Um, but in some cases, they're not. So you want to look to make sure you're, you're achieving that. Uh, and that's just because we're modulating that we're modulating the 90% isodose surface. And that's why we want to make the 90% isodose surface close as possible to that distal. We typically will take our depth plus three millimeters to determine our largest energy. Um, and then our standard SSD is 105. Sometimes we'll go to 110 or 115 for clearance purposes. Um, uh, but, and also for larger targets, that gives us a little bit more leeway of extending our applicators later on. So that's all done on the treatment planning side. All of this contour validation, the, con the doctor makes their PTV, we do our external, all of that's either in Pinnacle or Eclipse or whatever you use. Then you have to bring that 
those structures, the plan, and your CT data set images into the P.D software. And so you just do a pretty simple export by DICOM from your human planning system. You can save them somewhere on a server so you have them saved, you know where they are, no one can change them, no one can delete them. And then you import them just via their software um, using the import wizard, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then once you have it in, you can see it's brought in all the structures, you have your images down here. Um, you can't see it on this one, but they have the actual CT data slices on here as well. To start off the bolus creation process, you can, oh, I'll step back. First of all, you want to make sure you override densities first. Because what this is doing is it's not only looking at the structure, the PTD and the contours, it's actually accounting for density differences. So fat versus normal tissue versus lung is modulating the thickness based on density. So there's a heterogeneity correction within this software. So if you have a wire that's inside your external, it's going to see that really high density, it's going to cause problems with your bolus. So you want to override those densities. You can see I have wire in here, have an artifact, we overrode them to one. You can right click on it, and the only option there is to override. Um, you don't need to override your outer wire, anything outside the external, because it automatically will put the bolus in that region and assign it the proper density. And after you do that, you can select your bolus wizard. So it's a two-step process. The first step is to create the distal bolus surface, what's up against the patient. The second is to create the proximal bolus surface, and that's what's modulating our dose distribution. Uh, for bolus ECT, we use the optimized thickness bolus, just that's what we want to do. Um, although recently we've used the modified bolus, and if we have time later, I can describe that. But for standard, we use the optimized thickness. You have to verify your plan configurations. So energy that used to scan 120 KDP is pretty standard. Energy of the beam you're using, and since it brought in the beam itself, make sure you selected the correct beam. Maybe you brought in three beams, and you're looking at zero degrees, 20 degrees, and minus 20 degrees. Make sure you select the correct one. The external that you use, typically it's a modified external. You've kept your original one, but make sure you select that correctly and then the target. Once that's fine, you can click next. It'll move you into the first step of the planning process. So there's a couple parameters here, and this again is creating the distal bullet surface. And we think back to the original part of the talk, I was talking about the, uh, the block outer border. That's where you, you find it right here. And the standard is about a, is a centimeter. That's what comes in through default. We sometimes will bring that out to one and a half centimeters. We very rarely go less than that. We also define the depth beyond target, the minimum thickness of the bolus, and then there's some smoothing operators down here. We'll discuss those in detail. Like I said, the bolus outer border defaults to a centimeter. You may increase that for large targets. You typically don't want to decrease it. The minimum thickness is just looking on individual ray lines as it's coming through. It's keeping that at two millimeters. You want that for structure. You don't want that to have an opening where you actually have skin all the way through. That can cause some problems. And then the depth beyond target, it tapes the deepest part of the target. It looks a set distance, and the default for this is five millimeters. And then it will truncate the bolus five millimeters distal to the deepest part of the target. That's to minimize weight. These things can get heavy. We have to keep that in mind. Um, and so we want to do everything in our power to minimize that weight. You may want to increase it in some rare cases in order to provide more stability. In terms of the smoothing, there's two parameters. There's point spacing. Uh, standard is two millimeters. Fine is one millimeter. I think it goes to four millimeters in the course. Every single one of ours has used either standard or fine. You want to use standard for a very large bolus because otherwise if you use fine, it takes you forever to calculate. Um, for smaller ones, you can use fine for one millimeter spacing. What that basically does, it looks up the patient's surface at either two or one millimeter, whatever you define it as, and it's actually going to connect the dots between that to define what the surface should be. Just looking every millimeter, connecting the dots, and creating a contour, which is the distal surface. In addition to that, if you do every two millimeters, you might have a very rough surface that could be a little bit uncomfortable for the patient. So they have a rolling ball smoothing algorithm in which the parameter that you decide is the radius of this ball. How this works is, you imagine a ball that rolled across the patient's surface. Everywhere where that ball touches is where it's going to redefine the surface. You can see here there's a big dip, and we define the ball to have a radius larger than that dip. And so as it's coming across, it's going to redefine to be a lot smoother. And you can see that with the solid blue line here. And that again helps us, um, A, minimize these dips, but B, make it a little bit more comfortable for the patient. So you can see here, they put in those parameters on the upper left, and here's our patient. Once you've got everything you want, you can click generate bolus, and it will generate the distal surface only. And there's a white line 
that follows along, and you can see how it's outside the mask, it's touching the patient's surface right over the target, and then it provides us with a little bit uh, for breathing, so it extends over the nose. Once you've done that, you move on to a proximal bolus surface design. Some of the parameters that we're looking at here are defining that it's going to the 90% isolus line. We're using a technique called automated marching, uh, and that's the one we've used predominantly with a couple of exceptions, and if I have time, I'll go into that later. Um, and this is a process that goes through all of these steps iteratively. Uh, you define your target inner border, typically defaults to five millimeters, and then you have an ability to define how big you want and allow your hot spot. And there's always an interplay with conformality of your target, 90% of your target, and how big the hot spot is. And you can see how those are defaulted here. So like I said, automated marching, it attempts to construct an optimal proximal bolus surface. It uses a series of incremental surface reduction steps, and it really starts off with this flat top and steps down through there. So you can see there's a flat top bolus here. Step one is just to find an initial dose field. It does have its own dose calculation algorithm. And then it will step through, and I'll do that in a second here. As it steps through, it'll go slowly remove layers and layers using the creation algorithm I talked about before to really define how it's gonna shape. If it gets too hot, um, and I don't believe there's an example in this case, I have one a couple slides on, it'll do a smoothing algorithm. And that's how to get the hot spot down. So proximal surface design, like we've mentioned before, it looks at the depth, looks at what your R should be for your R90, and it makes the bolus, the thickness of the difference of those two along ray lines as it crosses over the PTV. It has a maximum of 10 steps that it's going through, and you can see on step number one, maybe only 6% of the distal surface is covered. And it iterates all the way down to, in this case, it looks like 38%, and there's a reason for that. And these are the creation operators I mentioned. After it fi finalizes that last step, it will truncate the bolus surface to make, again, reduce weight, and then it'll do a final dose calculation. You can see the truncation step right here, where it started with a flat top bolus and marched all the way down. It doesn't need this excess here, so it's just gonna cut it off and help us out a little bit. Typically how it defines that is it looks at the proximal surface, the highest point of the proximal surface, goes between two to six millimeters above that, and that's where it's gonna chop off for the duct distal. So the dose calculation algorithm that is used within their software is the pencil beam algorithm defined, redefinition algorithm defined by Hochschirm et al. It has a really high degree of accuracy and it's actually um, more accurate within heterogeneities than what's used in Pinnacle. Uh, it's actually looking at um, heterogeneities and can redefine at different levels how the scatter and how the stopping powers are gonna change. Um, but it's important to note that this isn't commissioned within your planning system. We don't show the doctors this dose distribution because what all of their experience is based off of whatever your planning system is. That's the planning system you've commissioned. That's the planning system you've validated over and over again. So when we show the doctors what they're looking at, we actually transfer this structure back into our own planning system, and that's what they're going to validate. Um, but as I mentioned before, it looked really kind of a bad metric. It said, oh, it only had 38% of the distal side of the PTV covered by the prescription. And that's R90. But if you look at maybe your 88% isodose surface, that's covering like 95, 98%. Um, and so it's, at that point, it's the scaling of the monitoring units once you get back in your planning system. Before we transfer everything across, we really assess the, as physicists and dosimetrists, we assess the quality of the shape of how it's conforming to our target. And that's what we're looking for. If it's the shape, if it's conforming really well, then we know that if there's minor differences in scale, we can do that and just by scaling our monitoring units a little bit. Like I said, we're going to export this via DICOM format back in our planning system. Uh, we use Pinnacle, and so that requires an FTP uh, that we set up to move our DICOM across and put it in the DICOM folder within the Pinnacle background. Then we override our density structure by to 0.92 grams per cc and assess PTV coverage um, based on what the planning system is giving us. And there will be differences. And actually, this when you bring it into your planning system, it looks sometimes a lot better because it's not accounting for a lot of heterogeneities. Um, but since that's what they're making their clinical um, decision on, that's what they're going to see. And as dosimetrists and physicists, we look at the other sides. We try to make it as good as possible within um, the dot decimal software, but we always have to bring it across. And at that point, if the planning process, MD is going to review the plan. And if they like it, we're going to order it using their dot decimal software again. Um, and you, it'll give you an option when you go into the order wizard. Uh, if you can order both the bolus and they fabricate like uh, apertures out of copper, 
we do all of ours in CeraVe, so we don't have that option. Um, shipping information, and you have the option to ship. It's rush hour 24, 48, 72. We almost always do 48. That's largely due to the fact that they're located in Florida, and we're located in St. Louis. And so if we do 48, we'll often get it in 36. If you're located in Vancouver, it might take a little bit longer, so something to talk to them about before you do your first one, so you have it when you need it. So once it's fabricated at their institution, they actually do some quality control processes to make sure that the bolus is of high quality. That information is sent to you, and I don't have an image of that. We review it, um, but we do our own as well. Uh, when I first get it, we'll look at the bolus just to see if there's any defects that may have come up in shipping. It could have been damaged. I haven't seen it happen yet, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, you also may want to reduce, even though we've done a lot of work to make it keep it down, there may be some sharp edges on the distal bolus side. So sometimes you have to shave off the wax bolus at that point. Um, uh, typically, there's no alteration that's needed, and I never change the proximal bolus side. That's what's defining the dose distribution. And that's really smooth side as well, but that's something I, I won't touch. Um, to prepare for our verification simulation, on the top of this bolus here, um, because they had the beam and they knew where the central axis was, there's actually um, some markings that show where the crosshairs should fall. And on, along those markings, there's little holes that are drilled. You can put, they send BBs along with it. You put the BBs in those holes, and you get to see where the crosshairs fall for your simulation when you want to match your verification sim to your initial sim. Uh, in addition to that, we'll print out these 3D renderings, and that helps us visualize at the time of verification sim how the bolus should sit on the patient's surface. Here's an example of the setup. Uh, we set up the patient as we had done for the initial sim. Uh, we register the bolus to the patient. Uh, a lot of this is done, we have some metrics to validate it, but a lot of it's done by feel because that's been designed specifically for that patient under that circumstance. It, it wants to sit in a very specific area, especially when there's unique features. And so on these circumstances, especially if I know my therapists are going to be the ones that set them up on a day-to-day -day basis, I'll have them put it on the patient and them feel how it aligns. And sometimes it just kind of locks into place. It's really nice. Um, but we don't trust that. That's not the only thing. We have a couple of the metrics we're measuring. Um, first of all, we have markings on our uh, we have markings on our patient. We have markings on our structures, and we can see how that's going to correspond to where we expect the central axis to fall. Um, and then when this is in the position where we want it, we can actually redo those markings both on the patient surface, which obviously wasn't there at the time of initial sim. We mark where it should fall on the patient's surface, and again on the alpha cradle or the mask or whatever we're using. In addition to that, from our planning system, if we are using a gantry angle other than zero, so say 15 degrees, or in this case, 18 degrees, I know my gantry angle is 18 degrees. My bolus surface should be 18 degrees. So we have a digital level that we're bringing in as well. And we can take both the um, hitch and the roll measurements, and they should be within, at the time of verification sim, it's a little bit broader than this one degree. I typically go out to three degrees, but they should be within three degrees of what I'm expecting. And that gives us another metric to kind of evaluate. And at that point, we can do a first simulation of the bolus in place. We see something like this. And we really, the most important thing is that we don't have, A, it's in the position we want it to be in, but B, there's no air gaps between the patient surface and the distal bolus surface. Uh, I'm looking for things less than three millimeters. Sometimes I'll I won't accept anything less than or more than five millimeters, but typically you want these spaces less than three millimeters. When you see them, the first thing you look at is are the features of the bolus aligning properly to the features of the patient? So say you see a toe right here, there's a little bit of the opening where that should fit. Let's say if it was rotated a little bit and that opening was here, we know then we have to rotate the bolus back to that other position. Even after that, let's say that everything is matching, but we have some openings uh, some further openings. This doesn't happen too often, but we'll sometimes fill those in with red wax, something that's malleable that you can put in a thin layer to fill that gap. Uh, look under, look at this under the lung window and level. Um, again, you reposition, rescan at time of verification. So once we have our verification simulation, that's transferred back into our treatment planning system. It's fused, registered and fused with our original data set. We can get a good idea to see how close we were in terms of the bolus. You can see here there's a slight rotational difference. And that's okay because our actual plan that we're validating, that we're bringing into the treatment planning system, is the verification plan. The initial one was to make the bolus. This one is to validate it's in the same position, but our dose calculation is coming from this particular scan. Uh, we look at how the contours fall. The contours are transferred across from the initial onto the verification. The MD has to come back through, validate their PTV is the same position. 
Um, and then once all that's done, you can adjust the block. You know, the aperture may need to be adjusted a little bit, like I mentioned before. Maybe the angle's a little bit different. There's very minor differences at this point. Recalculate the dose, and that's our plan. And this second step, this takes very little time. We prepare for the first day of treatment. We record a couple things in our record verify system. Uh, first of all, we have um, a projection of how the field's going to fall on the bolus surface, and that way we can align it correctly. Specifically, we're going to be looking at distances along each of the axes, but just the overall projection. Uh, in addition, we measure SSDs to different places. So we already know that should be 105, or whatever your standard was, to the patient surface. We want to know what it is to the bolus surface. Both the flat top, and I'll get to that in a second, both the, the modulated bolus surface, and we have this flat top. Modulated bolus surface may be really modulated. It's really hard to pick up an SSD within five millimeters, maybe even more. But the flat top is really good because you just lay a piece of paper over that. It gives you a really uniform position where you can get your SSDs. And we give all of these to our therapists. So first fraction of treatment, um, physics is involved at this. So we go to this original SIM, initial SIM, verification SIM, and first fraction of treatment. Patient's set up uh, using the markings that we did at time of verification SIM. So the bolus is put into position. You can see that there's some markings here. There's some sagittal markings along here. We've labeled what we expect the angle to be. At this point, this angle needs to be within a degree because we already know we can achieve that. Um, once the patient and the bolus have been registered, we treat that as one unit, one entity. And so we're going to then match our uh, projection to this surface that we had using the DRRs that I showed in the previous slide. So we align our light field, um, we verify SSDs, and then some doctors, depending how they order it, they may do some imaging. MV imaging is just for portals kind of, to kind of see that the structure is falling in the patient in the correct position. Some will do combing CTs to make, and then match it to the ROIs of the bolus that they have. Um, and that's typically done on the first treatment, just as some extra conf confirmation that it's in the correct spot. So that's the workflow. I just want to get into a little bit of time left, get into a couple special cases that we've seen. So case number one is for a nose. It's a 58-year-old female with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma at the nasium with extension towards the right needle campus. You can see how the doctor is wired all the way down side of the nose, right to the eye. It's crossing over midline, going a little bit down the other side of the nose. This would be very difficult to treat with standard electrons. Uh, and the doctor wanted to go to 22 gray, or 66 gray and 2 gray fractions, and we used 12 MeV. You can see the patient with the bolus in place. A couple things to point out. We have the edges marked, so you can clearly see that it's, it's fitting really well. It's lining up with what we had done as well at time of verification sim. Um, and then the angle is set to 21.5. All of this information is put in at time of verification. So. Bringing it back into our treatment planning system, uh, contours are transferred, doctor validate them, and we just recalculate. First step is always just to recalculate what your initial MU's field works. It's going to be really close. Uh, and you can see in this case, um, we actually considered using eye shields because the doctor was very concerned about dose to the lacrimal gland. Um, but we ended up not using eye shields just because the PPV extended into the eye and we weren't 100% confident the eye shield wouldn't block out that portion. So since you wanted to get treatment um, to that portion, we had to make sure not to use the eye shields. As a side note, uh, up until recently, we had a set of eye shields. Um, obviously, you can't sim with those in place. And so there's a lot of uncertainty of where they're going to fall. Um, for a certain, I think it's Civco, that decimal has a replica of it that you can take, put on during sim. I'm not sure what's made of plastic or wax of some sort. And that gives you a lot more confidence of where it's going to fall. We don't have those, so we weren't able to do that, but some institutions do. Um, and then we, yeah, we didn't use eye shields for this case, but we were able to get really good coverage and minimize the dose to the lacrimal gland, which is located on the outer portion of the eye. Uh, first fraction of treatment, uh, we set up again, it matches really well to what we did at the time of verification sim. Um, and just as a, some quick side notes, over the course of 66 gray, the patient had grade 2 skin reaction, which completely cleared up after six weeks. For the back initial simulation, this is a 34-year-old African-American male with dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans to the back. Um, again, I said this was the largest dot decimal we've used. We actually had to go for extended SSDs, 25 by 25 applicator, 115, and it was it was literally just, it was enormous. But it works. Um, we reversed the prone pillow so that it could be registered with the upper cradle, and that got his shoulders in the same position every day, and that was one of the things that we were really concerned with to start with. 
So we actually treated, this is a little bit different. The doctor was also concerned about two things. One, the dose of spinal cord, and two, uh, the dose of the skin. And so we had to do a little bit of a compromise. We used 80% dot decimal at 20 MeV, and then remove the dot decimal and use 20% um, at 16 MeV. Even though 16 MeV has very limited skin sparing, has some skin sparing, it dropped our dose at the surface by a couple of gray. It was just something that he was concerned about. Planning goals, 95% of PTD was covered by 95% of prescription. And you can see here that the 45 gray line is distal to the spinal cord by about, I think the maximum or the minimum pass is about three millimeters. And without the dot decimal, it was going down into the spinal cord. We went to 54 gray in two fractions. A lung D mean was less than 10 gray, V20 less than 20%. Um, heart D mean less than five gray, and V20 was less than 5%. Uh, and the big reason why he was concerned about skin was the patient had a skin graft, and he was concerned that it wouldn't take. And you can see some of our DVHs here. This was um, very complicated. We don't typically do half and half or mix, uh, so it involved a lot more um, forethought. We actually had to utilize Eclipse as well, because we couldn't do a dose calculation with a bolus in place and not in place at the same time in Pinnacle. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind that this takes, sometimes takes a lot of forethought when you get really complicated situations. You can see the verification simulation, how it fit on the patient, and how we marked it on his skin. Uh, in terms of the treatment, there's some dry desquamation along the surgical incision lines that you saw here. And that was where he was concerned, but um, six week follow up, skin had recovered from the treatment. Um, he did have a break in there four days between the 21st and 22nd fraction. And the final case that I'll talk about, a 71-year-old, otherwise healthy female with two centimeters clear, two centimeter clear cell sarcoma of the right lateral foot. Um, there's conservative local excision with positive margins. Uh, and this is a mixture of not um, dot decimal and, and not dot decimal electrons. We actually used two to one dot decimal weighted with six X proton beams. Again, 95% covered by 95%. Uh, 45 gray was to point, for the initial plan. Uh, to 1.8 gray fractions, PGD was retracted by three millimeters from the skin, and uh, 16 MEV was used with 137 mono units with 6x at 61 mono units. The mixed dose was the whole intention was to reduce the dose of the skin, but the dot decimal provided us the ability to pull dose off the bone. And you can see a couple of setup images here. Here's the verification simulation. We have it in place. This was, again, challenging because there's a lot of moving parts. The ankle can move, the foot can move in many different dimensions. Um, and so a lot of it was reproducibility of not only around the ankle, so we have the alpha pedal built up on the heel, on the toes, but also the knee because you're thinking about rotation of the entire leg and you can rotate at the knee, you can rotate at the hip. So we have our alpha pedal that went all the way up to the hip so that all of that was reproducible. Um, and then the other foot was held at uh, an angle so that we didn't have any beams exiting or entering through the opposite side. Uh, this bolus had 12 degree left to right, and then also a 3.5 degree soup to amp. Both of those were recorded from a verification sim and utilized through each fraction to make sure we could set up correctly. Here's the first fraction treatment. You can see how it's aligning here, it's aligning well here, and again along the leg. And then we draw the actual projection of the field at the time of first fraction onto the bolus. And that's just for setup. It, it, otherwise, it can take a long time for the therapist to go in there every day, make sure they've measured one centimeter this side, half a centimeter this side. If you draw it on there, they can line up, just line to whatever they drew it, and it's consistent throughout the process. So it makes it a little bit quicker. Um, typically, they put them in a 15 minute time slot after the first day. First day, we usually do 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how complicated it is. But once they're in and they're going, it's really smooth. Results for this case, there's erythema, which was resolved at time of six week follow up, and patient has maintained an active life, retaining ability to walk and hike, which was some concerns. And that is my last slide. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and the opportunity to present today. And any questions? We have a couple more minutes. Yes. Sure. So the bolus itself, depend, the cost depends on the size. Um, 
anything 10 by 10 applicator, 6 by 6 applicator, that's going to be $200 for the bolus. Uh, 15 by 15, I believe 20 by 20 is 450 and it's $1,000 for the really large ones. Um, we do bill, uh, there are a couple of extra bills that we can put in. Some are for 3D calculations, so it's actually not the same as a standard electron. Um, we, some of it's imaging verification, since we have to do the verification sim and the initial sim. One's a planning sim, one's actually a verification sim, similar to, I think, what like a cone beam CT would be. Um, for the smaller bolus, actually, the, we make up a lot of that cost in those bills, but for the larger bolus, which is very expensive compared to the smaller one, um, we're still eating a bit of that cost. And it's just largely because there's no set way to build this. It's a little bit different. Uh, and I can, if you want, we can talk later. I can get specific information about what the billing codes that we put in for each of these. I just didn't have them on a slide here. Any other questions? All right, well, enjoy your lunch. Thank you so much.